Well, this morning, uh, we are welcoming back to Riverwood Church, Armin Asadi. Uh, you may not remember, but I was, uh, what, six, seven years ago already, Armin uh, came around Riverwood. Uh, he was associated with Larry Gates. So he did a podcast with Larry, and, and Armin um, had did uh, met with our leaders, gave us great ideas about uh, starting groups, which we put into practice back then. And he also spoke at our men's breakfast uh, years ago, which um, uh, his story was um, uh, very, very interesting, very moving. Uh, he uh, has, and let me tell you that first. Um, he left Iran during the Islamic Revolution, which this, uh, what is it, 43 years ago that happened. It was just on the news yesterday. I thought they said it was yesterday to the day that happened. Anyways, um, uh, and his family fled there uh, without telling his story. Just let me say that. They experienced God's deliverance, God's protection, God's providence, and then uh, when he needed it, God's grace. And so it was a great story. I hope you can hear it again. I, but uh, and, uh, Armin has uh, worked with churches, uh, worked with Substance Church uh, in Minneapolis, uh, worked with the church you may have heard of, Eagle Brook Church, too, for a while. And um, uh, he, he's a good brother, and I'm so glad to see him again and uh, hear him bring the word. So welcome, Armin. How are you guys doing this morning? Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. All right, so let me just start off by saying I'm a terrible millennial because I don't have an iPad, so I'm using my laptop, so don't judge me too harshly. Um, let me just dive into this, and then I'll explain a little something about the change that happened for this message. I got kind of hit in the head by a curveball by Jesus, so uh, let me just start with this. COVID-19, racial injustice, political polarization, January 6, Roe versus Wade, Supreme Court, the Great Resignation, declining church attendance, pastors quitting at record levels, U.S. life expectancy declining for the first time in over a century, worship wars, culture wars, an actual war going on in Ukraine, old Christians staying home from church, young Christians deconstructing their faith the rise of Christian nationalism, the decline of Christian affiliation, housing is unaffordable, the national debt is unimaginable, employees are unhirable, ideological divisions seem to be unbridgeable, aging is unstoppable, death is inevitable, it's winter in Minnesota and the Minnesota Vikings lost the first game of the playoffs. <laughs> As usual. Um, Everything I listed here has created uh, very intense forms of division and has forced people into a level of isolation that we have never actually seen in America before. Um, one of the points I made was we are um, having life expectancies decline for the first time. So. Think about that for a second. With all the medical uh, advantages and advances that we have, somehow our life expectancy is declining. Um, so we've gone from a pandemic, which was based on COVID-19, and now we've gone into an entire epidemic, which is bigger than the pandemic, but it's all mental health related. Don't worry, none of this is gonna be political, I promise, everyone relax. Um, um, and because of this, uh, what I was going to be talking about is shame and vulnerability, which I was mm, ready for. And uh, God annoyed me into submission because I like to fight him. I've never won, but I argue against him all the time. And uh, so he changed the man message last minute, and I, and I hate this. Um, I, I hate feeling unprepared. It just makes me feel just insecure. You know what I'm saying, if you've ever been on a stage. So uh, I am no longer going to be talking about shame and vulnerability, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a, uh, a message titled, An Invitation to the Table. I just want to bring us back to the basics. I want to show you guys kind of what uh, the enemy is up to and how he's attacking the United States of America. Yes, I'm from the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, even though it is the fastest growing Christian population in the entire world, uh, which is ironic. 
but I, I will not be talking about any other country than the United States of America. This is our country, this is my country, and this is the society I want to talk about because this is the most philanthropic country in the entire world. When this country does good and this country does well, the rest of the world does well. So I want to focus here. Is that all right with you guys? All right. Um, so uh, I want to start off with a uh, Bible verse in Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Sorry, I, I, there's no slides, there's nothing. Like I said, last minute change, no sleep, just trying to prep for this. Um, so Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, if you have your Bibles and want to follow along. Mike, good to see you, man. When was the last time we saw each other? 2010. So it was like two years after I got saved. That's good, that's good. Forget anything I said back then. <laughs> All right, so Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Um, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's funny because I like to think that the problems that we deal with are somehow new in some way, shape, or form, but then you read the Bible and you realize there's nothing new under the sun, and it's true, and isolation is not new. And I mentioned a mental health epidemic coming out of the pandemic, so allow me to break that down for you. Um, statistically speaking, even prior to the pandemic, the United States of America is, was, and remains the most socially isolated society on planet Earth. There is no close second place. We are the most socially isolated country, culture, society on planet Earth. And, the, and, and this isn't philosophical, it's not some ideolo ideology or theory, okay? So there's actual metrics behind this. It says um, they base it on the amount of time we spend alone in a car, the amount of time we spend in front of a TV, the amount of time we spend in front of a other screen. Uh, the number of days per week a meal is had around the dinner table with friends and family, um, the number of hours we work, and the list goes on and on. But the outcome was our country took the gold medal, and it's the one gold medal we didn't want, actually. Um, if you're asking how can isolation be that big of a problem, then you're asking the right question. So let me, let me, let me get into some actual statistics here. But before I do, um, just keep in mind simple verses. Like Proverbs talks about isolation a lot. I, it sounds weird, but the book that's all about wisdom constantly talks about don't be, don't be alone, don't be isolated. Um, Proverbs 18.1 says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Um, and, I'll tell, I, and I'll tell you how that was very, very real for me during the pandemic. So according to Harvard University, loneliness is a culprit in a whole slew of problems, including depression, anxiety, substance abuse, heart disease, and domestic abuse. Problems that all appear to be taking up aggressively during the pandemic. In late June 2020, the prevalence of anxiety symptoms was three times as high as the rate reported in the second quarter of 2019, and depression was four times as high. Moreover, loneliness and depression can brutally compound one another with depression breeding loneliness and loneliness breeding depression. Research suggests that loneliness can curdle into suspicion, contempt, and aggression as well. Loneliness is related to worse physical and cognitive functioning and earlier mortality. Research also finds that lacking social connection carries the same, if not greater, health risks as heavy smoking, drinking, and obesity. And this suffering and these problems are likely to only spread and deepen over the winter as people become more isolated and the absence of loved ones feels more acute. That was, that was verbatim from Harvard, okay? None of that was me. Um, I know, and I'm sorry, guys. I know stats are boring, but I, I, I rarely get this change your message last minute thing, um, unless it has significant purpose. 
And more often than not, that purpose is for one person, maybe two people, and not the majority, but I've learned I'm okay with disappointing you guys. I just struggle with disappointing God. Do you know what I'm saying by that? So if it doesn't apply to you, can you just pray with me that it applies to the one person that this might be for? Awesome. All right, so furthermore, I'm going to keep doing stats, okay? Because I, 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 I want you guys to know, uh, I know it's easy to stand on a stage and opinionate and uh, throw out philosophies and different theologies that we might not agree on, but I, I, I want to show you hard facts that are agreed upon even in the most atheistic universities, okay? Um, so according to Dr. Holt Lundstedt, professor of psychology and neuroscience, she, she was a bit more pithy and direct. She says, isolation and loneliness increase your risk of death by 26%. Isolation and loneliness, living alone or poor social connections are as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's not permission to go smoke 15 cigarettes a day if you got some friends. Um, isolation and only loneliness is worse for you than obesity. Isolation and loneliness and social isolation are associated with an increased risk of developing coronary heart disease and stroke. Uh, isolation, loneliness, and social uh, uh, social isolation increases the risk of high blood pressure. Uh, isolation, loneliness with severe depression is associated with early mortality, and loneliness is a risk factor for depression in later life. Isolation, loneliness, and social isolation puts individuals at greater risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Here's the irony of all of this, okay? is I have just spent the last six years of my life running a military ministry as the president of this nonprofit, this ministry, and I dedicated the last six years of my life taking soldiers, the men and women of our armed forces, out of the mindset of I need to isolate myself to keep myself safe so we can try to prevent them from committing suicide. I dealt with suicide on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis. And more often than not, I'm working with our special forces communities and um, their, their, their traumas are so extreme and their stories are so extreme, it's almost impossible to repeat them to anyone to get any form of empathy, okay? So, I, and here's why it's ironic is that... Um, couple of reasons. One, this was something that everyone told us not to do. So every mentor that we had, every pastor that we talked to, um, anyone that was around us, we had this vision that we wanted to go after, um, and which was we wanted to do a tribute for Vietnam veterans. Um, we wanted to welcome any Vietnam veterans in the house by chance? No? Okay, good. Um, yeah, we just wanted to do it, and everyone said not to do it, and uh, we went after it nonetheless just because, again, we felt like God was in it and behind it, and so just to give you guys an overview of how massive of an undertaking this was and why people did say don't do it, um, just the activities that we had at this event was A-10 Warthogs military flyovers, missing man formation flyover by the U.S. Air Force, with an actual bald eagle um, fly over the entire audience. We had Bryce Cherry Holmes, who uh, he is missing his legs, and his dream was, I want to be able to stand for the national anthem one more time. And uh, he got prosthetics and stood on the stage and saluted the flag for the first time, and, uh, and the, whole, uh, the whole place was just wrecked by this guy. Um, we had na uh, national anthem, Savannah Madison, bandit flight team. We had Navy SEAL Patriot Parachute Team. We had music by Six String Soldiers, Natasha Owens, Craig Morgan, Justin Moore, Toby Keith. Our speakers lineup was Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, Governor Ron DeSantis, Mark Eyes Geist, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, Medal of Honor recipient Major General Patrick Brady, Chris Noel, and Ann Margaret. Um, and we filled this stadium. It's the sixth largest stadium in America. It's called the Daytona International Speedway. Has anyone ever heard of the Daytona International Speedway? Okay. So we packed that place, the ground, with over 40,000 people um, just to give tribute um, to these Vietnam veterans because we realized um, we were helping a lot of active, active duty soldiers, but the people that were committing suicide at the ast most astronomical rate was actually 
Caucasian males over the age of 65 that are usually Vietnam veterans. Go figure, right? So, I mean, we, we, were, we were heaven bent on doing this event because we knew it m meant the saving lives. And um, here's, here's where the irony gets even um, crazier, but this event we did was called the Heroes Honor F uh, Festival. And on the way to this um, 10 xing or growing your organization by 1,000% in one year, it sounds really cool, gives you a lot of ways to brag. We were the fastest growing nonprofit, we're awesome, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is the toll that it takes on you is unimaginable. And so the irony is, um, and the reason I hate even wanting to do this message and I fought against it so hard, is I've never actually shared this publicly outside of close friends and mentors. But on our way to Heroes Honor Festival, I almost took my own life. Um, I almost widowed my life of 11 years. Um, I almost uh, left three of my daughters fatherless and innumerable people broken and confused. Because of this, I actually ended up in PTSD mental health treatment for a month and a half. I thought I was going to be gone for two weeks, but apparently I was more messed up than I thought. Um, the only reason I'm even alive today is because of the people. And I, I just want to reiterate this. It's people in my life. They quite literally forced me to be healthy. Um, I remember my big, tall, giant, freak of nature friend who was a Division I wrestler in, uh, in college, and he was All-American. He's just, he's just one of those scary guys. He r randomly shows up at my door, rings the doorbell, I open the door. He goes, get in your basement, sit on your couch, and tell your wife to come down. <laughs> I could fight you and die, or I'll just go along with it. And so I went along with it, and uh, we sat down, and he forced me to tell my wife what's going on. That was the first time. Um, it's amazing how God uses people. I, I think we get so caught up on um, what can the church do? Um, what kind of outreach can the church do? What kind of missions can the church do? When the reality is there is no church in this world that can do anything without its people. The church is the people. If this church is powerful, it's because you're in it. If this church has influence, it's because you're doing something about it. If this church is making impact, it's because of you. These walls, what songs have these walls sang for you? What prayers has this stage prayed for you? What what ch these chairs, have they ever invited anyone to break bread? You are the church. You are the most significant part of the church. And if you weren't in it, this would be nothing but a just building. Who cares about a building? You guys are it. You guys are the weapon of God. And what's happening in our culture right now is that there's the enemy using this thing called isolation to get you guys alone and if, I, and if I was the enemy, if I can just get you to say to me, I got this, that's exactly the moment I know I got you. If you think you can do life on your own, if you think you can handle anything that you're doing, that life throws at you on your own, I promise you, you have been lied to, you have been deceived, you cannot. Yes, you might be introverted and can do it, but just because you can be alone and not be, I don't know, de-energized from it or whatever doesn't mean you should. Isolation is a form of a weapon that the enemy uses to keep us away from the thing that makes us the strongest. And the thing that makes us strongest is this. It's not about somebody speaking to you or at you. It's just about us being in community together. The power of God manifests in us being together. When there's more, two or more gathered, how many verses like that do you guys know of? Okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm kind of proud of myself. I didn't start bawling like a small child. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I think it's hard. You know, no one wants to stand on the stage and be like, I almost killed myself as I ministered to other people. It's, 
Like, there's a lot of shame that comes with it. Like, if I could jump out of my body right now and disappear, I would, just so you guys know. This is not comfortable for me. Um, but just understand that we live in the most hyper-independent country on planet Earth. If you're in any other culture, whether you're living in the United Kingdom, China, Australia, it doesn't even matter where you live, it is actually very common to find three generations of family living together in the same house. Okay, now can you imagine me coming and hanging out? Mike, I see you for the first time. You ask me what's going on. I say, hey, I'm a 40-year-old man living with my parents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? It's easy to judge me. Like, what, what is wrong with you? Why are you 40 and living with your parents? But the reality is the entire rest of the world, that is actually very, very common and in much, much smaller spaces. Like in China, the average home is about 580 square feet, and they have about six people living in it, which represents three generations. So grandparents, parents, and children. It's crazy. But in America, it is a sign of weakness. It is a sign of a lack of growth. It's a lack of maturity. It's a lack of prosperity. It's a lack of all sorts of things. It is a faux pas in America if we are not living alone. But the reality is... Loneliness is dwindling away the thing that makes our culture so powerful. We're getting so self-reliant, we're forgetting why this country is so amazing and it's the people in it. And we're distancing ourselves as if it's adding power to us or giving us more control or giving us more of anything. It's not. It's diminishing us and who we are. From a Christian standpoint, as a culture, we're more likely to switch churches than any other Christian on planet Earth. We're also more likely to move more frequently than families would ever normally move. And then, when we move, we're more likely to move further distances than any person would normally move anywhere else in the world. And then, even when we plant ourselves in a particular city, we generally will commute further to our jobs uh, than any other human on planet Earth, and then we tend to work a longer hours than most cultures do globally, okay? You guys still tracking with me? All right, feel free to take a nap if you need to. <laughs> um, and of course, when we're at home, we participate in more socially isolating entertainment experiences than any other nation on the planet. Think in terms of binging on Netflix. Anyone? You wanna, you wanna, you wanna confess? I've done that, no, all right. Um, or whatever else. I'm, I'm not pimping out Netflix here, whatever other thing you're using. Um, if you're introverted, I'm going to keep saying this. It's okay that you're introverted, but it's not okay that you're isolated. Your life expectancy will literally drop through the floor when you're socially isolated. That's a statistical scientific fact. Isolation will make your life expectancy drop through the floor. From a scientific research standpoint, your statistical odds of happiness will drop through the floor. Not just that, but your odds of just being happy are slim to none without a good, solid support group. Your odds of divorce skyrockets when you don't have supportive relationships outside of your spouse. Someone was on stage promoting something, women's events. <laughs> that was a great point. Um, all right, get this. Crime rates and violence tend to increase primarily in direct proportion to a society's isolation. Did you know that it's actually quite staggering when you see how just even if you measure a culture's quantity of TV watching will actually increase homicide rates? Process that for a second. And, it's not bec and everyone's probably assuming, yeah, oh, because we watch too much violence. It has nothing to do with the violence we watch and has everything to do with the isolation. How crazy is that? Um, all right, let's keep going here. Uh, I'll, I'll just skip some of these because I feel like it's going to get too negative. But here's what we're missing out on when we don't have constant interaction with each other. We have no idea how to negotiate anymore. We don't know how to have a win-win. We don't know how to have a compromise of any kind. Turn on the news and tell me if I'm wrong. Go to social media and tell me I'm wrong. Do you see win-win scenarios happening in our society anymore? Or is it, have we, I grew up in the hood in Minneapolis, OK? 
okay? And you either wore blue or you wore red or you made sure to wear neither color. Why? Because you're either part of one of those two gangs or you're not and you stay out of it, right? Our society has become a red and blue gangs. All the money, all the knowledge, all the Ivy League schools, some of the best industrial revolutions, some of the wisest people, some of the most educated people, some of the richest people, and we have narrowed our politics and what's driving our culture is a red gang versus a blue gang and we're at odds. You're either with us or against us. We don't know how to win-win anymore. We don't know how to negotiate with each other anymore. We have lost the premise of the thing that makes us significant as human beings. It's our ability to be together. And we're losing it. And there's a purpose in the church that goes beyond the building now. Because the weapon of God is different, I know, shocking, than the enemy or the weapon of the enemy. If the enemy is trying to force us into isolation, what is God trying to do? What is God trying to do with the church? There has to be a stance. We have to come together. We have to know how to be with each other. We have to know how to fight against the enemy. We can't keep surrendering and submitting and just accepting the fact that isolation is easy, so we'll embrace it. He wants us to be holding hands. He wants us to be confessing to one another. James 5.16 says what? It says, if you confess your sins to one another, you will be what? Healed. It says we confess our sins to God for forgiveness, but it says we have to confess our sins to one another for healing. How often do we confess our sins to one another? How often do we make it so that we can even be vulnerable? How often do we make it so that someone doesn't sit here and tell us what we should do just because they confess a simple sin as if we're superior to them and have no sin of ourselves? There's a battle cry, and I hear it. And it doesn't require us to wield the sword. It just requires us to be the sword. And to be the sword, it is the simplest thing in the entire world for some of us. I can't cook for crud. But um, the reason I named this thing an invitation to the table is we just got to go back to the basics, y'all. You guys have small groups, connect groups, all these things that you guys are doing, and you probably think, well, this is just what churches do. No, this is a weapon of warfare. Wage war. Invite people to your table, break bread, do communion, do a Bible study, hold hands and pray, go fishing together, go work out together, go shoot guns together, do whatever it is that you do. Do it in community. Let God wield you as a sword, bring other people into it. Sometimes the greatest thing I need was to be around people and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And it required somebody just coming and Get in their face. They might hate you for it in the beginning, but when you realize there's someone's life being saved in the process, they'll thank you for it. Comfort doesn't always mean it's good. I wasn't comfortable with people calling me out. I wasn't comfortable with my buddy forcing me to sit down with my wife to tell, him I'm a tell her I'm a suicidal mess. It's not comfortable having massive amounts of social anxiety and being invited to a party you don't want to be at. But did I regret any of it? No. How, I, how could I? I'd be dead. I'm standing here. I'm standing here. My, you, I don't know if you guys saw my girls run up to me. I can't imagine I, I, that I was that selfish and I would take my own life. I can't imagine a life without my kids having their dad. They are daddy's girls. Except Thug Life, our two-year-old. She's a mom's girl. <laughs> she could care less about dad. <laughs> Sorry, I choked up. I was trying really hard not to. Um...
there's an epidemic going on and it's all based on mental health as I've mentioned before. But if you, if you guys just wanna look at some statistics, just look at the statistics of crime rates, divorce rates, mental health disorders, um, look up how bad domestic abuse and um, addiction rates are right now. Think about this way. If we took every therapist, every psychologist, every psychiatrist, every counselor that we have in the country, and then we take uh, the ones that are still college students that only have two years left, and you take all of them, all of them, and you prematurely take them out of college and put them into the professional position where they're legally allowed to provide counseling and therapy to people, we would still have a shortage by about 23%. We, we literally don't, we didn't have it before the pandemic. Now we, we just, now we're just overwhelmed. We're underwater. And you can't even reach your hand up to stick your fingers out of the water. And yes, everyone is flooding into counseling. Because it's safe. What if church, as people, we were safe? What if there was invitations to our table on a regular basis? What if we just broke bread together, sang, sang songs together? What if we just went hunting and fishing together? What if we just talked and joked and watched the Vikings lose together and cried on each other's shoulders? Why do we live in Minnesota? Like, ah, it's not crazy. It's not complicated. It's not complex. It, and, and, and if you're, I, I, you're an introvert, you're probably like, ah, I hate people. It's all good. It's all good because it's good for you too. It's not just for them. It is a win-win scenario. Did you know that in America, this is so random, that if you're over the age of 55, that there is, I think they said 65% of people over 55 say that their TV is their closest friend. It's so sad to me. Like, oh my gosh, why? And let me just prove this to you because um, in John 13, verses 34 and 35, where he's trying to explain to them, uh, this is what makes us different. This is how, if you want to know, to reveal the Father's heart to the world, this is how you do it. And he said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, everyone say this, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I have consulted well over 100 churches. I've helped plant over 35 churches, some in the Middle East, some in Africa, some in random other places, China. I can tell you of all the countries that I've seen the church, including a church in Afghanistan, by the way, uh, about 300 miles away from Taliban. Um, they, they don't have small groups. They just do it. It just, it just happens. They just do small groups. They just do connect groups. They're always together. They're always sitting around the table together. They're always eating together. Any, in middle, any Middle Eastern country you go to, they're constantly drinking tea like it's their lifeline. Like If they're not drinking tea, they're probably dying. You know, it's just what they do. But in America, we have to be so intentional about it. We have to have programs. We have to have small group methodology. We have to have connect group methodology. We have to have so many different methodologies just to make sure it happens. Because if the church isn't pushing it, no one is pushing it. No one is going to push it. You guys are so important. You guys are so significant. You guys are the weapon of God. He chose us to be his weapon. He doesn't need us. Can he snap his finger and change everything? Sure. But why us? He wants us. And he believes in us. He trusts us. We have the ability to become the magnetic people that draw people into community. And that community, I guarantee you, from a scientific standpoint to a theological standpoint, I will die on this. You will save lives. How many of you would be okay saving a life? Would you be okay saving a life? Have dinner, have breakfast, have brunch. Just invite people back to your table. It's not hard, I promise. If you guys want to see some crazy church growth, 
Small groups is considered one of the greatest church growth methodologies in the entire country. Why? Is it the theology we preach in small group? What theology? People are playing volleyball and going fishing. How is that a church growth methodology? It is. I can guarantee you it is. But it's not a pastor running it. It's just everyday people that are just sitting in chairs lists like you guys are. And here's the thing is, I, I really pray this is landing, but uh, we, we have a mantra at our church. I, I think you might remember this, Mike. Um, we all, and we reiterate this as often as we can. We say church doesn't start until the service is over. I'll say it one more time. Church doesn't start until the service is over. This is our weekly meeting. We get fed. We get encouraged. We connect. We high five, do whatever it is that we do. My church, we can't do handshakes to save our lives. It's always the awkward no, because we got it young and older, and no one knows if you're going in for the fist bump, a high five, a handshake. You remember those, right? It's super awkward. We're awesome at that. Um, I just do the bowing thing now. <laughs> just to, hey. Um, but I, I, I do, again, I, I pray this is landing, because otherwise you're going to miss out on a lot of things that God has for you, this church, and the people in your community. Isolated encounters with the Bible does not make us disciples of Christ. I'll say that again. Isolated encounters with the Bible does not make us disciples of Christ. It's loving community. It's small groups. It's authenticity, as scary as it is, because people will shame you. It's inevitable, but it's okay. It's prayer. It's confession of sin. Um, it's just the community that you bring in. I'm sharing these things because I really believe that God wants us as Christians to help r rally our culture and revisit the foundations of biblical uh, Christianity. I just think God is trying to shake us up. Just trying to wake, like, wake up. Wake up. Look at the battles going on around you. You're not winning. Wake up. God didn't, even when he talked to Peter about, on this, on this rock, you will build my church. That was an offensive strategy. It was a military strategy. He wasn't, and he's saying the gates of hell shall not prevail. He's not saying our gates will prevail. It's saying the gates of hell should not prevail. That means we're the ones kicking down the doors. We're the Navy SEALs. We're the special forces. So when he said on this rock, and he said in gates of hell, that's us going in. That's us going on the offensive. That's us kicking down the gates of hell and taking territory in the name of Christ. We're the ones bringing heaven to earth. We're the one booting hell out. And it's okay, and it's okay for us to rise up, and it's okay for God to sometimes just grab us and shake us up. And I do believe that's what he's doing right now. And, I just, I, and honestly, I do believe that God wants you guys all to experience the supernatural favor of his love and grace, or to put it another way, and this is really critical, is, and feel free to write it down, pen and paper on your phone, whatever, is victory often grows in proportion to our vulnerability. Victory often grows in proportion to our vulnerability. We have to get honest with people. We have to get honest with each other. Get praying for us. That's where gracious favor comes for some of us. The delay of our miracle isn't just so that God would reveal himself to us, but it's so that God can draw us to his church. The people of God and the word of God can carry us through. I say this because I wonder how many of us are just one prayer partner away from a breakthrough. How many of you guys can use a breakthrough? Anybody? No? I know I could use it. I don't think you guys are far away from your breakthroughs. I think there's a chance that you're sitting next to someone that's your breakthrough. I believe that the relief that you're looking for is someone probably sitting in the same building as you. I believe there's people out there that are contemplating divorce, suicide, homicide, whatever, that might be in your own community, and you're about to thwart that, change that, and turn it upside down by just knocking on their door and saying, hey, you want to come have breakfast with us? God's not complicated. He's dang good at what he does. He's a 
God of love, he's the author of love, and there is nothing in this world that love can't conquer. And he's conquering with you guys. There's something so significant about who you guys are. So let me start wrapping this up before you guys um, start throwing tomatoes at me. So uh, just think about simple things like uh, in even the first book of the Bible in Genesis where the way God talks about um, let us make uh, man in our image according to our likeness. Do you, you guys remember that? So e even in the very beginning, he's talking about the, the, com the communion of the Trinity. So uh, here, here's an interesting fact. Did you know that the Trinity is one of the, is, is one of the things that, that is accepted across all 40,000 denominations that we have now? Yes, we have 40,000 denominations across all 40,000 denominations. And if the Trinity is not accepted in your Christian belief, you are actually considered a heretical um, religion. So like Mormon, Jehovah's Witnesses, something like that, right? So you have 40,000 denominations that are, can very all very easily agree that the, one of the absolutes of the Bible is the com communion of God, the Trinity. And we're made in his image. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What communion are we in? One of his last acts before he went to the cross, what was it? Where he broke bread, the wine. Sorry, there's kids in here, grape juice, welches. He washed feet. Can you imagine your master being down there? And I, I'm from the Middle East. Those feet are nasty. <laughs> They're nasty. I, I, I wouldn't touch it with a broom. I mean, bless you. <laughs> Maybe a mop. But the God of the universe kneeling down, taking his own robe, grabbing their feet, putting it in a bowl, washing them and blessing them. You can't find a lower position. He is the master of the universe. So is it weird? Is it strange? Is it ridiculous to think that maybe he's calling us to do the same thing when the world spirals out of control into isolation, domestic abuse, mental health disorders, suicide, Homicide, addiction, alcoholism. Is it that crazy to think that maybe he's just calling us back to the very basics of biblical Christianity? Break bread. Who knew that something so simple could be a nuclear powered weapon in the kingdom of God? And the only people that can do it are the people who just say yes. Don't overthink it. Don't get overwhelmed. Just do it. Show up. Have people show up. Um, here's the thing is, I, I, as I think about an invitation to the table, um, what, one of the best small groups I was ever a part of was the most awkward group I've ever been to. Do you remember Freshwater? Jason with Freshwater? No. no. He had a board game group. And I was interning at the church at the time, so my, one of my jobs was to go to every small group. And um, I love awkward. There's like, I, I, awkward makes me laugh. So when there's awkwardness going on, I'm actually kind of happy because I think it's hilarious. But this group, holy Mary, um, they took awkwardness to another level, and I just, I did not know how to be in that group. Um, but I, I, there was just something, I, I, I just wanted to be like, I'm done. And I went back, my pastor is like, if that's the group that is, is the hardest for you to be in, that's the one you should be in. And I'm like, ah, why did I tell you? I hate your advice. So sure enough, I keep going back to it. And uh, I went like two, three times. Um, I actually ended up having time in my life. I, 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 like, collect board games now at my house, okay? Like, I, I'm full-blown nerd right now. Uh, I'm turning my kids into nerds, too. We play every, every board game you can possibly imagine. And, and, and I picked it up from this group. But 
Um, this guy that was in there, I, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone that has lost the closest people to him um, um, from sickness and illness uh, than this guy. I, I, I think he lost four people in his family within six months to either cancer or heart attack or some gastrointestinal issues, something like that. I mean, this guy was like, his family were dropping like flies. And I just remember, now, okay, I'm fresh out of organized crime. I'm a former crime boss of a syndicated order, organized crime group coming into a church. I'm interning. I'm, I'm still, I'm saved, but like there's a lot of residue of my past. Do you know, like colorful language, even when I prayed. And, um, and I just remember being in the hallway with this guy, and this guy wouldn't talk to anybody. Like, he talked to everybody, but he wouldn't talk about himself to anybody. And I remember he, he, he saw me, he's like, walk with me. I was like, I ain't what it is. So we walk, and we go to the back of this hallway. And we, we used to, our church used to meet in a, a, a high school, uh, like a public high school, right? We were, we were 2,000 members in our church, and we still didn't have our own building because 70% of our congregation was under the age of 29. And you know, 10% of FAFSA money doesn't get you a lot. Uh, <laughs> so we were just in these, this high school hallway, and he's just telling me this, and he's irate, and he's angry, and he's freaking out, and he's, you know, middle finger to the sky kind of scenario, and he's just so mad. And, I, and honestly, my, my, my whole thought is, you should be mad. I would be mad. I don't know who wouldn't be mad, who wouldn't be sad, who wouldn't be grieving, who wouldn't be throwing a tantrum, you know? And the day, uh, the day before, I remember having a conversation with one of my, uh, the, one of the MDiv students in our school, uh, in our intern program, and, he, and we were just having a random conversation. I said, what's one of the most interesting things about the Old Testament to you? Because he loved the Old Testament. And we loved debating. Uh, and um, I, I just remember him saying, he's like, I don't know why, but I keep thinking about um, the Jewish culture. When somebody died, how people would just show up to their house, and they would just sit there in pure silence for seven days. No one would say a word. They would just be present. They would just be with them for seven days. So that the mourners can mourn and grieve while they prepared food, drink, whatever they needed, but they wouldn't say a word. It was a ministry of presence. And I'm in a situation where I'm like, man, I'm not saved enough to handle this situation. I, I, how do I handle four deaths in six months? And, uh, and I just remember ministry of presence. And I remember sitting down with him and just being like, man, I think I'm going to spend a lot of time with you this week. So if you don't mind, I'm going to call you every day. And I spent every day with him that he was available. And I just remember it was two weeks after that when he was on the verge of taking his life or converting fully to atheism. Um, and just two weeks of time together, he actually ended up giving his life to Christ in our church. It doesn't take much the ministry of presence. That's all your small groups are. And if I could give you guys just a simple action item, just invite people to your table, attend your small groups, be the church, and watch you change this world. I promise you, you will. The church is the most powerful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. The people in this room, you guys are the most powerful people you'll ever know because this is the group of people that will look out for you, be there for you, stand up for you. But you have to risk vulnerability you have to be audacious with it, and you will probably be shamed in the process because people have a confidentiality issue, but that's okay. Keep going. You hear me? I know I'd rather do rah, rah, rah for you guys. I'd rather try to be funny even though I'm not. I'd rather be infotainment, but I just, I just, I just coming out of the season I came, I, I really feel like it is life and death. And you, you guys are what make life and what saved lives. Can we pray? Jesus, wow. Who knew that in a world, in a country that we had every privilege, all the wealth, all the power, all the security, 
that somehow we would miss out on some of the most valuable treasures that you have ever given us, which is people. Lord, we know that the currency of the kingdom of heaven is people, and I just pray, God, that in our culture, right here in the United States of America, that we would start to see and believe that we are the currency of your kingdom. I pray, God, that our hearts would swell and come to overflowing for the people in our own community. God, I pray that we would see someone we detest and hate, and that we would consider a foe or an enemy, and our love for them would start flowing, that we would start praying for the ones that we even detest and hate. I pray that we become the type of culture that even prays for enemies across the globe. I pray that, God, that we would stand up and manifest love in ways that changes communities. I pray that wherever there is a church, anywhere in this world, God, that it is impossible for community not to take place. I pray, God, that every single person in this room, no matter who they are, how old they are, what gender they are, no matter what their background is, that they realize that you are the ultimate weapon for God and that you have chose them, that you have chose them to be an instrument of love, that you have chose them to be an instrument of your voice, that you have chose them to show the signs and wonders of your love. So God, I pray that you are blessing these individuals here, that they're not leaving being the same. I pray that there's an inspiration to rally and mobilize the people in this community. I pray that it becomes impossible for anyone in Cannon Falls or Northfield or any other city nearby to talk to people without Riverwood being mentioned because this is such a community-driven church. So God, I pray that we can rise up and become the individuals that are changing this world by following the basics of your manifest, which is to simply invite people back to our tables and break bread and have communion. So we surrender and submit all this to you and just pray that your will is done and not ours. In the name of Jesus, we pray.